your session. So the uh, Board of Supervisors of the County of Del Norte, State of California is now meeting in regular session. Only those items that are timed at a specific time will be heard at those times. All other items may be taken out of sequence for staff and public availability. We have a full agenda, uh, but I would like to start with a moment of reflection, please. Thank you. Now I'd like you all to please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance led by Cindy Henderson. Thank you, Cindy. Cindy is our emergency <laughs> services manager, for those that didn't know. Um, report out of closed session? No reportable actions today. Thank you. Any new employees to be introduced? No? Okay, so at this time I'm going to request deletions, corrections, or additions from board members to the agenda at this time in order to be placed on the agenda as an emergency item. It had to have arisen subsequent to posting the agenda and requires action prior to our next meeting. Uh, there is one such item, and that is an invitation for, uh, from Congressman Huffman regarding last chance grade stakeholder group. While there was verbal communications out, there was most recently an email to all the agencies involved to designate somebody. And uh, seeing as how the meeting is on the 30th uh, that we'll be attending, we would like to have the board's approval on that. So it does require action prior to our next meeting. So can I get a motion that it is an emergency item, please? Second. So we moved and seconded. Any discussion? Okay, then we, uh, all those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Carries unanimously. It will be placed on the agenda. Uh, I also, we're going to pull at the request of Supervisor Howard. Um, there is a resolution, item number 20. So there's several resolutions regarding the uh, community facilities district and the PACE program. We're going to pull that and have a presentation regarding that. Uh, it's um, an item with a lot of interesting information and, and uh, we'll schedule it for our next agenda and have that coordinated with Supervisor Howard. He's agreed to help out on that. Are there any other items that need to be pulled or added to our agenda? No? Okay. Then let's go forward and receive brief announcements uh, relative to County Del Norte programs and projects from our supervisors and start with Supervisor Howard. Thank you, Chair Finnegan. It's been a busy couple weeks since we last met, and I'll start briefly by covering a few of the programs that took active interest in. And I, I always love to start my meeting specific to our goals this year to literacy and the year of the child. It's a, it's a great avenue for this board to participate, but more importantly, it's a great avenue for the board to pay attention to what's most important to this community, and that's the future of our youth. In doing so, I've I met with uh, several groups, including First Five of Del Norte County and the Del Norte Child Care Council, actively uh, engaging them in supporting literacy in our community, which they've been actively engaged in as groups within our community for a long, long period of time. Got a chance to meet those partners within those uh, two groups. And I was glad to hear that there's willingness and openness no longer to work in silos, but more importantly, to reach out and become community members in tackling the issues of literacy here in Del Norte County, specifically for our youth. So I definitely encourage Supervisor Finnegan to keep up his hard work and efforts on both those boards and continue moving those forward. I participated in a great discussion with Sheriff Apperson and Smith River Neighborhood Watch. I think uh, Sheriff Apperson stole the show there in reporting out on the events around the Highway 101 incident a couple weeks ago. But more importantly, I think um, the communication that is taking place within our communities, specifically our outlining communities, some of them in my district, 
is extremely important, and I'm glad to see Sheriff Apperson continue to make that concerted effort to be out there and present in our community of Smith River. I also attended the Delnart uh, School Board meeting. As you are aware, the, the school board, like many others, including the Delnart County Board of Supervisors, uh, has a critical job to do with the future of our youth. And I'm encouraging the school board as they move forward with their selection of a new superintendent is to keep paying attention to what's most important. And you know, sometimes when we look around, we often let dollars get in the way of good decision-making processes specific for children, especially around literacy. And we make those decisions not based on the best available information or the best available science or the best management practices and how children learn. And so encouraging the school board as a member of the Donut County Board of Supervisors and as an individual with parents in the district I think is extremely important and I will continue to encourage the school board to make changes uh, to implement successful literacy programs in the district and also work with their community partners such as First Five and Donut Child Care Council to uh, become one silo, one group of arrows moving in the same direction. Participate in the Grants Goals Committee meeting. Uh, we'll be hearing a little from our director on that today. Also met with Charlie Helms, who I see is here today to present to us. I won't cover that any further. Uh, took Steve Perez's note to heart and uh, went down and spent quite a bit of time with uh, Health and Human Services Director Barbara Pearson. She gave me a great tour of our facilities and uh, introduced me to just about every employee in there. And it was really good to see smiling faces and a, a very a robust change in environment and more importantly needs of our community being served and I compliment Barbara and the energy I see in her staff right now and I continue to do the great work I see you doing there also uh, spent some time with the healthcare district with supervisor Hemmingson specific to uh, two by two that also is with the city council um, we will probably be moving forward, I would hope, soon with Supervisor Hemmingson making a recommendation to support a resolution that the health care district has requested that would support more of a community-based approach specific to um, tackling our issues with Sutter Health. I think this is a, a really good suggestion by the district as in recent correspondence uh, between the district and Sutter Health representatives, the uh, district has been scrutinized a great deal and more specifically scrutinized at a level that they are looked at as one body within our community. And I don't think the issue with healthcare and more importantly the issue with the employees at Sutter Coast Hospital is the issue here. It's more importantly about the representation and how our community is represented in the future specific to health and serving health needs here in this community. And this is a community issue. And as the health care district requested, I think it's a community issue best represented not only by the district, but also by the Board of Supervisors and City Council. And with that, I'll close that discussion. Thank you, Supervisor McClure. Yes, thank you. I, um, I too have been quite busy the last two weeks. In fact, I had to miss the last meeting because I was on my way to um, San Diego for a Coastal Commission meeting where the um, the Veterans Memorial was approved and there were a couple other items in Humboldt County that were both approved without any appeal, which is always a, uh, a good thing. Following my, um, following my time in um, San Diego, I was able to go to Arizona and see my son and watch the greatest baseball team in the world play three games at practice and that being the Giants <laughs> just in case anyone wants to know who I was rooting for but then I was um, invited and I attended the um, local the local officials the local government commission which is a statewide commission that is um, made up of elected officials and we had a three-day conference in Yosemite it's called the Awani Conference, and it's a conference designed for elected officials across the state to get together and talk about the opportunity to have sustainable communities, to have walkable uh, neighborhoods, to have protection with policing, to make sure that our water is good, to make sure that we're taking care of our waste products um, efficiently, to make sure that economic development is moving forward. 
And I'm just going to give a little brief overview of the um, of the conference itself, of the the type of things that we covered. And um, the well, before I move into that one, I also before I left town, I participated in a um, process with the man who's heading up the search for a new superintendent of schools, and he kind of had a little bit of a roundtable of what. What do we see? What do we want? And it, it was kind of just a brief roundtable discussion. So at the Local Government Commission, I was able to sit in on um, workshops that covered um, racial equality and how to close the gap within your community, and also what was called institutional equality, which um, it was interesting. They gave an example of a um, city in uh, Southern California that had a bunch of different street lights. And every time the street light, someone would call to say the street light's out, someone would go and fix it. But in the poorer communities, those phone calls weren't made for, for a, a myriad of reasons. And it took the community to come together and say, you know, if you just came up with a plan to change your light bulbs on a, on a regular basis throughout the count, throughout the district, Maybe everyone would feel protected and the lights would all be on. And sure enough, they've done that and they've gotten rid of all of the complaints about not being able to see. And seniors and children are able to move on the streets more freely because everything is lit. That was just an example of how little you can do to change the entire institution of equality within a community. But they also, then we went into quite a lengthy discussion of what's called participating, participation, par participatory budgeting, which was very interesting because it actually takes, New York City is doing it, Vallejo is doing it, and there's a couple of cities in Brazil that are doing it. And what it is, is it's an actual taking the dollars that are going to be available for different services within the community and you, end up having community meetings and community engagement to talk about the possibilities of what people would like, what they would like to see in their community. And it ends up, like in Vallejo, they currently allow any citizen to participate, and any citizen who participates, they're allowed to vote on where they think the budget, you know, should it be a children's park, should it be a new dog park, should it be um, a senior citizen's uh, dial a ride bus, what, what should we be doing as a community? And um, the people as young as 16 are allowed to vote. And so it's this incredible public engagement where they actually then take the dollars and say, okay, we're gonna eyeball three parks this year. And, they and so the budget is voted upon by the people. It's ultimately approved by the Board of Supervisors, but it's a um, extremely interesting uh, concept and I, brought home all of the stuff on participatory budgeting that even CDBG at this point has recognized that this kind of budgeting may be very effective for social programs because then everyone feels that they have an input. In fact, they gave an example of a father that was advocating for um, new sidewalks in this, in this area where he lived, which happened to be fairly affluent neighborhood, but he was, gearing up everybody, you know, to, that that's what should be done, our new sidewalks. And then when he learned that there were several schools within his community where the young women didn't have doors on the restrooms, he switched completely of what he thought his priorities should be and said, you know what, we need to make sure that all restrooms have doors. And so that it crosses over, it's not just the county or the school district or the city, it's budgeting that crosses over to all aspects of the community. So it, it's, an, it's an exciting concept and I have a lot of research to do on it, but I would like us to take a little bit of a look at that. We also, there was, Sacramento has done a really comprehensive strategic plan on um, the children, on what we're doing for the children and where we're going. And so I brought their strategic plan back because I think that with our goals, that looking at a strategic plan of where we see our services for children today, five years from now, and 10 years from now, what, what is it going to look like, I think is an exciting vision towards the future where we can sometimes 
Sometimes we get in a, a place where we're just planning for today and we're reacting to a complaint that possibly came in on a phone. And this, like a, a strategic plan for children may be of assistance to see the greater vision of what our community can be. So that was a, an exciting development. I also had, for the first time, the Federal Reserve was there as a sponsor of this conference. And it was like, what would, why would the Federal Reserve of San Francisco be in the middle of social programs? Well, it turns out that the Federal Reserve in San Francisco actually has a community development arm of where they try to gather data, where they try to assist communities in economic development, and even have dollars connected to them. So I think it's a new avenue that we probably hear, I don't think we've been taking a look at. The, one of the more alarming uh, topics was about carbon credits. And Supervisor Hemmingson has for a long time talked about how they don't seem fair to rural communities. And as the discussion moved forward with Palo Alto being now at a zero carbon production, which we know that if you're living in the Bay Area in San Francisco and you have 100,000 people coming to your community to work every day, they're arriving by bus. So there is some kind of carbon footprint happening, but they get these carbon credits. And so I was able to talk with the presenters and I'm hoping that we can get uh, Senator McGuire on board with us of the unintended consequence of carbon credits in communities because when a lumber company sells a carbon credit and says they're not going to do a harvest, then the community where that harvest would have taken place loses any kind of revenue. So we need to be at the table when carbon credits are discussed because communities like ours will become a um, highly sought after place for these carbon credits. So we need to be talking with the lawmakers on the other side that the, unex the, un the unintended consequences need to be addressed prior to, to the agreement of signing part of our community as a carbon credit for another community that's more affluent. Um, we talked a lot about um, data and being able to capture the data with different programs, which I'm going to pass on to IT. And then um, we did a lot of discussion about transportation and the new mobility of transportation. For instance, with the Uber and Lyft cars, there is a possibility that, that folks who use a program like Dial-A-Ride may be more apt to be able to use an Uber or a Lyft car, and it may save communities money in, in applying that kind of mobility. Because really, our network of how we transport one another has really not changed since forever. I mean, you either get on a bus or you get in your car. And so maybe the Uber and the Lyft may be something that we should be looking at. We don't have it here yet, but it doesn't mean that we can't have it. Um, and then we also, there was a, a interesting um, publication that has just been made by this guy named uh, Mark Puck. He, he goes by Puck and he's a United States retired Marine that is in, um, Western Reserve University in the Great Lakes region and how they're trying to rebuild the economy of, the, of their area. And they published a, a publication that's called the National St Strategic Narrative of how communities can come back and reinvest in themselves and how we can all kind of participate in our own destiny with economic development. So I'm getting that, a copy of that and I will read it. We also covered um, some exciting things with some bike programs of stolen bikes where Sacramento is um, online registration that you can register your bike. And then when, it, when they have it in their hands, they know who it belongs to because you've registered your bike. And so it's an online registration. They also do um, bait bikes and they've been able to up the arrest because a lot of people, especially in low income communities, the bike is your mode of transportation and when it's stolen, 
it's trouble, and I know that we probably, over at the sheriff's office, probably have an entire garage of bikes that have been recovered, and they can't return them because they're not registered. So it's a simple, uh, low-hanging fruit uh, activity that we can improve the quality of life in our communities for our, for our citizens. And then I'm also, separate from the convention that I attended, I'm working on um, AB 694, which is a low-cost visitor serving accommodations for overnight accommodations on the coast. Because currently, with the Coastal Act, when a new hotel is built, they charge a mitigation fee that's quite steep that goes into a, a fund. But that fund is designed to have hostels and campgrounds. And the discussion is, what about families you know, that are on vacation, a family of four? Many times, camping is not an alternative. And at the same time, a hostel visit is not an alternative for a family. So this AB of 694 is trying to figure out how we could take those mitigation dollars and actually apply them to some of the low cost hotels and motels that we still see along the coast that have an incredible pressure on them to sell, be torn down and build the $500 a night boutique hotel. So this is a, a plan that we possibly were looking at the idea of having a revolving loan fund that the small innkeepers could use to keep their accommodations up to par and still be able to have an affordable rate. So I'm, I'm looking forward to that. This week, the Senior Center meets Redwood Park Association had their um, fundraiser in Arcata. I have uh, a meeting with the EMS and Prior to my leaving, I met with Juvenile Justice Commission, and I'm meeting with a couple of commissioners on some current concerns that they have at Barrow. Thanks. Thank you. Supervisor Hemmingson. Yes, thank you. Um, I had an invitation from the Tea Party to uh, um, speak at, uh, at kind of a town hall uh, meeting uh, having to do with uh, priorities uh, um, of supervisors and, and the board. Um, it was very interesting, uh, well attended, um, a lot of question and answers, uh, seems to be a thirst out there for information, um, and uh, I think it went very well. Supervisor Gitlin and I uh, were uh, both uh, participants uh, and uh, overall went uh, very well. Uh, we didn't get through very many priorities and uh, were scheduled for about 90 minutes and we were at two hours uh, in a it seemed like a very short period of time, um, but uh, all in all, I think it went very well. <clears throat> Excuse me. I had a resource uh, conservation district meeting. Uh, again, uh, these grazing permits that Fish and Wildlife uh, have had in the past, uh, we missed out on last year. They were supposed to put these new leases in place this year. Uh, Humboldt County was the, the lead um, on this uh, uh, grazing lease program and that uh, evidently has fallen apart so we are going to be another year now without grazing leases. Um, geese are going to be uh, uh, going on to uh, more private properties now. The local uh, farmers and ranchers are going to have issues with, uh, with uh, the birds again probably with the geese. Um, so all in all you know fish and wildlife is not being our friend in this particular instance. Had a local transportation commission meeting. Um, I actually had a couple of uh, local transportation commissions, commission meetings. We had a special meeting that we approved some funding for uh, some uh, facilitation on uh, uh, meetings that we'll be having uh, with for last chance grade. So looking forward to that. Um, as uh, Supervisor Howard uh, said earlier, uh, had a health care district meeting, uh, and we will be meeting, um, uh, uh, Supervisor Howard and I will be meeting along with, uh, with uh, CAO uh, Serena and we will, and the city, and we'll be putting together a resolution um, that will support uh, the health care in our community. Also had a short meeting with Mitch Hanna, who has now uh, been named uh, as the permanent CA, or the CEO or CAO of, uh, of uh, Sutter Health or Sutter Coast Hospital here locally. He'll be 
um, he'll be part time here and part time in Auburn, I believe, is his other hospital. Uh, seems to be a very uh, upstanding guy, so we'll look forward to uh, meeting with him. Uh, my main reason for meeting with him was to set up a meeting uh, for uh, uh, Supervisor Howard and myself, and possibly uh, uh, CAO Serena, uh, maybe to meet with him to go over some specifics. Um, but that's probably not going to happen until the second week in April. Uh, but we look forward to that. Uh, I did uh, filled in for uh, Chairman Finnegan on agenda review. I went to the Leiden Awards, and I'd like to congratulate all the uh, winners, I guess. Um, we're the winners, actually, uh, because of these uh, people who uh, put their lives on the line, the volunteers, the, the special awards. Uh, the, these people uh, in law enforcement uh, do absolutely wonderful job for us. and. And uh, this is a very small tribute, but uh, um, it, uh, it, it seems to work. It, uh, they do a great job, so uh, I was glad to go to that. Uh, had an interview from uh, Deborah Whittall. Uh, I asked uh, CEO Serena to sit in with me. She wanted to interview um, me on ways of being more open to the public and accessible and how they could get more information out and more information back from the public. Um, and so we spent about an hour uh, going through uh, those things. I will be attending uh, the listening session in Reading tomorrow evening. Um, you know, it's really kind of funny because they're having three listening sessions uh, and evidently, they only want to listen to you if you live in Seattle, Portland, or Reading area. Um, they don't really care much about any of the rest of us who um, are not in the more populated areas. So I haven't been to one of these yet, so I hate to criticize it before I go, but um, right now I'm not, uh, not too awful happy with having to travel to Reading to talk about our forest that's doesn't even come close, or I shouldn't say close, but doesn't affect uh, the people in Reading at all. Uh, and uh, I did have a local area formation commission meeting yesterday. We talked about the uh, southern county districts. Um, we had kind of a workshop, and we'll be discussing that further. And I'm glad Supervisor McClure brought up the carbon credits because this has been a kind of a thorn in my side for for a while because it really doesn't fix the problem. You can buy your way out of pollution. So all you have to do is buy a credit up here in our county to fix your problem in LA County and that makes it all good. And that to me is just wrong. We get saddled with the, uh, um, with the responsibility of keeping our area clean and green and, uh, and they can continue to do what they're doing. So not really, uh, really happy with the carbon credits. And, and what they do to, uh, the, in, in the timber industry is what little we have left will be gone if, if that continues because there won't be any reason for anybody to cut timber or to harvest any uh, timber if they're going to get paid more for not doing it than doing it. Um, and it, it doesn't change anything. It doesn't help anything. It hurts us. So uh, that's it for me. Thank you. Supervisor Gitlin. Yes, thank you. Um, also, a couple of busy weeks. I'll try not to be too repetitive so my colleagues have gone over some things we were in attendance on. But two weeks ago, Thursday, uh, right after the March 10th Board of Supervisors meeting, I headed down to Eureka to attend the monthly meeting of the North Coast Unified Air Quality Management District meeting. Uh, we discussed budget issues, and there's a surplus there, and that's always good news. Uh, but also on the uh, agenda was discussion of possible action to dispose of furniture, desks, file cabinets, tables, room dividers, and other inventory left during the recent sale by the California State Automobile Association to the North Coast Unified Air Quality Management District. And all that inventory is there. So I'm happy to report that that's, this inventory will be available on a first-come, first-served basis to our local governances 
including the city and county departments and department heads who have been uh, so notified and to make arrangements and call the North Coast Unified Air Quality Management District to examine the inventory and make arrangements to pick up that inventory as needed. So first come, first serve. Our grants goal committee met Friday and that report will be coming this morning uh, shortly. Uh, also last week sat down and had a chat with the chief, uh, the new chief Ivan Minsel, and we exchanged ideas and viewpoints on how law enforcement can best serve our community. Very productive and uh, an outstanding gentleman. Uh, Sutter Coast is in the news again as you're hearing. They issued a news release that it postponed its application to lower the status of the hospital from its current acute care 49 bed facility to a 24 bed critical access hospital citing the hospital's status of profitability in 2014. Well since Sutter has continually declined the Board of Supervisors request for meeting minutes and financial statements it's very challenging to try to validate the current and now robust status of public uh, the, of Sutter Coast. And um, so I placed calls to the California Department of Public Health and Medicare Manager for non-term uh, care, Region 6 of the uh, Region 9 in San Francisco for an update under the Freedom of Information Act uh, with regard to the suspension of the critical access application by Sutter Health. Um, also, a constituent called me um, regarding some work that had been done on Washington Boulevard uh, between Birchall and uh, Herald Street. The constituent lived on Herald Street, and because of the city needing to gain access into the uh, Elk River there, they cut back a lot of brush. Um, the constituent pointed out, and quite justifiably so, that it's now a bit of a traffic hazard because uh, that road across there, Washington Boulevard, heavily traveled road, it literally drops straight down. So if you pull over on the apron, which is wide enough to accommodate a car, and you happen to go out the side of the uh, passenger vehicle, you're going to go straight down. So I've spoken to our roads department to take a look-see at this, and also our engineer to see if um, this matter can be somehow mitigated and um, uh, some kind of signage there, some kind of barrier, because I'm afraid that's an accident waiting to happen then. Uh, I was escorted on a tour of Remy Vista Youth Services last week, met its director and some of the seven therapists who work there. Uh, one question I asked is, how do we place a psychiatrist into the Remy Vista service? And the question is extremely timely. I do not share the opinion that psychiatric teleconferencing is a preferred tool in delivering vital services, especially to our youth. It's kind of a surrealistic situation where someone is looking into a TV set and someone is talking back to them, and especially for a child, I find it a bit problematic. So the timing is very important that we push this envelope to see about getting and having a psychiatrist uh, come to our community, and I anticipate some exciting news on that possibility from Department of Health and Ser Human Services in very short time. I also inquired how more advanced notice can be forwarded to those professionals seeking continuing education hours. Delano County's remoteness makes it difficult for our professionals to contain or gain the continuing education hours uh, when their services uh, do come to Delano County, so perhaps more time can be set aside ahead of time so the therapist can adjust their very busy schedules. Tuesday, March 17th, at the monthly Del Norte Solid Waste Management Authority meeting, commissioners voted four to nothing to interview all nine candidates for the public position, giving the opportunity for everyone to properly vet themselves to the authority for this uh, two-year term. Uh, the discussion will take place at the April meeting. That evening, I attended the annual law enforcement leading awards, law enforcement Del Norte leading awards at the Cultural Center, where the best of the best are recognized from the District Attorney's Office, Search and Rescue, Pelican Bay State Prison, California Highway Patrol, State and National Parks, Crescent City Police, and Del Norte Sheriff's Department, an honor to be there. Area One Agency on Aging hosted a public meeting at the Senior Center uh, this past week. Seniors learned about the services offered by the agency for housing, transportation, and food needs. As a result of that meeting, I met with a senior who was there who asked me to look into additional expanded Meals on Wheels services for Smith River. Currently, services do not extend beyond Fort Dick. So I've invited that senior to come to our next Redwood Coast Transit meeting to discuss 
if perhaps our buses can help deliver meals up there with a volunteer, properly trained volunteer, there to facilitate services in Smith River. The Chamber Advocacy Committee met to discuss two problematic billboards on whether the Chamber should render an opinion in, uh, on this matter. I'm very pleased to report on a severely graffitied billboard at mile number 44.50 and Smith River was completely cleaned up. I express my appreciation to the property owner and want to thank Supervisor Howard for assisting in this blight removal. Thank you, sir. Uh, I want to offer congratulations to Point of Honor Veterans Committee, which was awarded the Coastal Commission permit to build the Point of Honor Monument at the S-curve, which was referred to by Supervisor McClure before. It has indeed been a long wait, many years, uh, but the Coastal Commission permit is in hand, and now the bids will be let, and um, we'll move forward on building this. So I want to special thanks to the city of Crescent City for absorbing the costs of water and lighting providing to the monument, and want to thank all those veterans who have worked tirelessly for this day. Uh, the local board of emergency food and shelter programs sponsored by FEMA has asked me to join its governance. It seems uh, to be a certain demographic which I fit. I'm not quite sure which one it is, but the chair of the local EFSP, Catherine Balk, will be seeking a $16,000 grant from the national board. And once awarded, Catherine will be responsible for those funds to local recipient organizations within Del Norte County. The local board will meet the end of May as part of its, or June, as part of its plan to implement this valuable program. Uh, LAFCO uh, met yesterday, as uh, Supervisor Hemmingson referred, uh, discussing um, Southern County's um, issues. And I will say that volunteers are still needed for Saturday's Take a Bite Out of Blight program, the Crescent City Lions Club, and Take a Bite Out of Blight. And, We'll be cleaning up uh, Department of Fish and Wildlife property on Highway 101 South, just across from Sand Mine Road. That's this Saturday, March 28th, 8 a.m. to 1 p.m. We'll see you there. Thank you. Thank you. I also had a busy couple of weeks, but I'm going to be extremely brief uh, since we're running a little behind. Had the first five meetings started off after our last meeting. We reviewed the strategic plan, had a port SAR meeting, which is search and rescue down at the harbor. Uh, with all the affected partners trying to get a search and rescue small boat station down here. Have been working with uh, the congressman and all the powers that be for years now on that. Had another meeting at the Family Resource Center with the Child Care Council regarding child visitation. Had that discussion regarding upstream versus downstream, uh, or you can say prevention versus intervention. It was interesting that a lot of the partners, if you work in intervention on the downstream, it's hard to assume the role of prevention. Uh, and so uh, looking at the partners getting together and, and discussing that and figuring out how to work together and where those services are needed. Had a local transportation commission meeting, National Forest County Schools Coalition, uh, which my board member, we had a call in. Just today, we found that the one-year extension for the Secure Rural Schools money, which is an additional million dollars to this county, uh, on top of the 25% rule, um, actually it's probably closer to 1.3, but uh, it is now going to come before uh, uh, the House on a, excuse me, it's going to come before the entire Congress, I believe, on Thursday. It's being attached to the Medicare reimbursement bill, so it will probably pass, and it's going to be a two-year extension, not a one-year extension. So all that's good news so far. Uh, had another local transportation commission meeting, as was said, regarding funding for the stakeholders uh, uh, facilitation for last chance grade. I uh, sent my apologies for not being able to attend the lead-in awards because I was traveling at the time to go to a regional council of rural counties meeting down in Sacramento. The onslaught of bills that's going to be coming forward will bury us. Hopefully something will be accomplished. Uh, the carbon credits, I have to weigh in on that as well. I think it's a travesty that we get the parks and the recreation area and the national forest and we get none of the credits for that public land. Uh, that should be returned much uh, the way mitigation is uh, when uh, public land goes in, when private land goes into public hands. And with that, Jay, uh, CAO report. Over the last couple of weeks, I've been working on staff and department head evaluations. I've had meetings with the public, meetings with departments and department heads at their request. Been working on the year-end budget meetings. Um, have had employee negotiations. 
have met with the superintendent of the school district regarding recreation and facility use as requested by the board. Um, had a conference call as mentioned by Supervisor Hemmingson with the Forest Service. Uh, was involved in a conference call with North Coast CAOs regarding marijuana and the potential for future initiatives and getting out in front of those. And uh, I will hopefully be bringing forward a policy document that will be brought to all county boards on the North Coast to adopt a, a consolidated policy statement, hopefully one that addresses issues for all of the counties and has a little bit of uh, sway when it comes to the initiatives that are coming down and we'll probably see in the next couple of years or next year. Uh, discussed some recreational options with the city uh, in regards to cooperation and uh, preparing for the goal workshop at the next meeting in April. Uh, we'll set the table for the board to have that discussion and, and give direction. Received notice this morning that in regards to the meeting over elk, um, that the head of the wildlife branch is not going to be available until at least June to travel to uh, Delmar County. So I will be looking into trying to set a meeting up in June uh, if we cannot do it a little bit sooner. But uh, in order to get him here, that's what his schedule has. Um, we'll be reviewing some uh, legislation that's come in recently, and I'll discuss that in a little later. Thank you. Um, I'm going to hope that it's the sentiment of this board that since we've been asking for over 60 days to meet with Cal uh, Fish and Game or Wildlife, whatever they're calling themselves these days, uh, whatever they're calling themselves, they're not doing the job regarding the elk and that it is not acceptable that we be put off for six months to have a meeting uh, regarding this elk management plan that was mandated four years ago. Um, if it's by consensus, this board shoot a letter to them that is not acceptable for that kind of delay and we want to meet with them sooner if at all possible. The answer I think we all know is going to be no, they can't. Uh, so please schedule it appropriately. Also, um, I did I uh, want to mention that on April 21st, this board is going to have a special meeting. Um, it's going to be at 5 o'clock. We're going to have a viewing of the Raising of America, dealing with early childhood and the future of our nation. It is going to be sponsored. It'll start at 5 o'clock uh, with a little bit of socialness out in the foyer, and then uh, reviewing uh, a discussion, the movie, and perhaps some actions coming out of that. That will be the 21st of April. I, the reason I bring it up is to give you a heads up, but also I would ask the CAO to please send a written invitation to the school board and to the city council and to the tribal councils, basically all the elected policymakers that have anything to do with children. Um, and then uh, there's others that will be invited as well. So with that, we're going to go to public comment. Any member of the public may address the board at this time and any item that is under the purview of this board. If it is scheduled, I might ask you to wait. You don't have to, but you might not get hurt for a second time. Public comment, please. Mr. Helms, welcome. Good, good morning. I didn't want to jump the line. No, no I didn't no. want to steal your thunder by reporting out that I met with you. Okay. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah. Hi, I'm Charlie Helms. I'm the harbor master at the Crescent City Harbor District. And um, privileged to be in front of you all this morning. The, the Board of Harbor Commissioners has directed me to, to reach out and float an idea that the Harbor Commissioners have come up with to community leaders and the community in general. You know, as you're all aware, the, the Harbor reconstruction is done. I mean, we have a beautiful Harbor here now and the extension of the California Coastal Trail and the interpretive trail around the Harbor. I mean, these are all because the community pulled together and worked together to get it done. You know, especially considering the community development block grant that, that the county walked through on the harbors by half to get a lot of this done. I mean, it, and to me, that's the best way to get things done in any community is to get everyone to buy in, to love the idea and do it. Um, unfortunately, the harbor also had to take out a $5 million USDA loan, uh, which we're making our first principal and interest payment this year. So we're actually yet in a deficit position. So because of the deficit, uh, the Harbor Commissioners have been brainstorming and came up with an idea that, that we know, we feel, we'll get the Harbor back in the black and also become a really enduring community asset. So what uh, we want to bring before you today is the idea of the North Coast Tsunami Center. And I believe, 
I, I wanted to meet with everyone individually. I, I missed two commissioners, but I still want to get with them individually. But yeah, the idea that we came up with is a North Coast Tsunami Center. And what this would be, would be a building placed at the corner of Highway 101 and Citizens Dock Road that would be a vertical evacuation site for tsunamis and also offer shelter in place space for tsunami evacuees. Uh, the first floor would be elevated. There, there wouldn't be a first floor. It would be pilings. It would be about 16 feet high with uh, interlaced support underneath it because in the case of a tsunami, there's a lot of scour. So there's a lot of engineering that goes into these. But the second floor would be an actual tsunami learning center since this county is noted across the country on being the most prepared on what to do and the cooperation that's gotten. We want to have a learning center there so people can find out what do you do? How do you save your life? How do you save your community? Um, part of it would be a 48 seat 3D, 4D theater where people could actually go in and experience a tsunami without suffering the devastating effects of it. On the third floor, we'd have meeting space that would be the shelter in place area for people using the site as vertical evacuation and uh, harbor offices and meeting rooms when it's not being used for evacuation. And this is just an idea that I want to bring before everyone, get the community's input on it, and, and if the community does love it, then I will be out trying to raise funding. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Charlie. I think I know you met with myself and some others. Great idea. You got a great little pamphlet. If you need the board to take some action in the future, please come back to us with it. Okay. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Charlie, thanks. I Sorry I didn't get hook up with you. I went down there a couple of times and you were gone, but I, I didn't call first or anything. I, I just thought I'd maybe run into you. And I know. Happen. We've been trying. I've been thinking of going by your office, it'll, too. So we'll, we'll get it done. It'll happen. Thank Good. you. Thank you. Any other public comment? No? Okay. Then we're going to go to our 1030 timed item, which is a public hearing regarding the uh, CDBG grants. Good morning. Before you this morning for uh, consideration and approval is our 2015 Community Development Block Grant application. Um, the notice of funding availability was released in early January and approximately $25 million is available in funding. Um, the county application could be a maximum of $2 million and include up to three activities. Um, there have been some changes. Um, this year to affect this NOFA wherein the CDBG will now be using the community uh, survey, American Community Survey, uh, for determination of the low to mod income uh, percentages. Uh, basically what this did was lowered our low mod percentages to 41.4 percent, which is a reduction of over 5 percent. In order to qualify for low mod, you have to be 51% or above. Um, so with the recent changes, um, we've met the citizen participation requirement as a public hearing was held on January 29th. And basically what they did was uh, I obtained information from the community uh, to provide input as to the design phase of the project. And then on March 13th, we held a grants goal committee where I sought uh, support of the committee for the application. Um, based on that, our application that we're going to move forward if approved today, it contains three projects, one of them being public services, which includes CASA and our senior nutrition program through the senior center in the amount of $500,000. And we're also going to be including a public facilities project, which is the uh, ADA improvements for the uh, Smith River Community Hall. Um, then we're going to be including a public improvement project uh, for the Best Maxwell Safe Ross to School project. Um, in order to make the public facilities and the public infrastructure or public improvement projects work, um, we've had to tailor the projects to meet within low mod areas within the community or census tracts, and we've done that. Uh, Smith River Community Hall is in including a new income survey that they're finishing up as well. Uh, the application will also include general administration, which is about $130,000 that is used to monitor the grant over the term of the, the contract. Um, 
the new thing that we're going to be including this year is what's called a supplemental project. Um, basically what this is, is, is we're going to be including a supplemental project for code enforcement. Um, since changes to the program income rules last year, saying that we had to basically use all of our program income prior to drawing down on grants, and the fact that that would leave us with leftover funds available in the grant, what this will do is this will allow us to utilize those additional funds and it'll roll down and it'll fund these supplemental projects. Um, so basically what, what the, what it'll do is let me just, I can't even see that screen. I need to get glasses. I apologize. <laughs> Say for instance, we have $75,000 of current program. In, thank you current program income on hand um, and we have a drawdown request to CDBG in the amount of 150000 We'd have to use our $75,000 of program income prior to being able to draw down on the grant, which leaves us with those leftover funds, um, which will affect us, again, if we're not able to spend 50% of our grant money by the next time we're able to apply for an application. So basically what we can do is we can say, okay, well, we've got $75,000 in program income that we want to use to pay down this grant. So what it'll do is do you see how down below, and then we have another $75,000 of the drawdown because we had a total of $150,000. Basically what this does is it, draw, it, draw, it reduces the amount of the, the grant overall, but this $75,000 is now going to be able to be used for this supplemental project. So it's going to be a big help and it's going to allow us to be able to include more projects within our application. Questions? Yeah. Um, uh, Tony, uh, is this the only supplemental project we're going to have and what are the, what's the criteria for a supplemental project? Uh, um, basically, it can be any type of project that d is not as public service. And this is, at this time, the only supplemental that we'll be including. So, so can we, does, do these items have to be done now for supplemental? They have to be put in with the grant? They have to be submitted with the grant, so they're, they're basically, they be, basically, once approved, they become a part of the actual contract that's been approved by the state. So the only restriction is going to be the... Um poverty level or the income level yes. of the project? Well, what we've done is we've taken that into consideration for this as well, and it's only going to benefit certain areas within the community. It's not going to be a jurisdiction-wide code enforcement. Right. Um, to be specific, this is actually going to, the areas that are going to be included are Filkins Tract, the Roosevelt Tract, Klamath Glen, Hunter Glen, and a portion of Smith River. Okay. Any other Questions this time from board members? Well, I was just curious if there was time to add more. I mean, the supplemental things aren't necessarily going to be funded. Is that correct? Correct. Only if there's money that's left over. Well, and if it's an, if it's an eligible activity right. according to CDBG rules. Correct. Right. Interesting. Thank okay. you. At this time, I'm going to go ahead and open the public hearing. Thank you. Um, any member of the public that wishes to address this item regarding the allocation or input, please step forward, sign up. State your name and be heard. Anybody? Good morning. For those of you that don't know me, my name is Charlene Maisie. I am the executive director for the Del Norte Senior Center. And I want to thank the board and the county for including us in your application. Um, we appreciate the, the funding that we've gotten through this before. Um, we were in a position last year of being on the application that wasn't funded. Um, what that resulted in was a loss to our program, um, the senior nutrition program, of about $125,000 for a two-year period. Um, we've managed to um, scramble and, and keep the doors open and keep the meals served, um, but we've had to do that by cutting staff and cutting the nutrition down to the bare minimum that's required by the Title III guidelines. Um, 
and you know my staff has has been stellar at doing the work of five people with only um, for a few months with only two so I really um, want to say that they have been uh, extremely um, dedicated through this and our dedicated volunteers have helped a lot um, so we're definitely hoping that this will come through. It will allow us to look at um, not only getting back up to where we were um, staffing wise, but, but looking into expanding to other areas, including um, Smith River doing a needs assessment up there. Um, so we do thank you. And I'd be happy to answer any questions you have. Thank you. Nope. Great, thank you. Thanks. Any other public comment? Welcome. Welcome. Good morning. I'm Christine Saletti from the executive director from Casa of Del Norte. And um, I look at uh, all your faces and most of the community now is uh, uh, understands the um, need of a CASA program in Del Norte County. And I want to thank um, the Board of Supervisors and the county for including us in the CDBG round. Um, also, the community support has been amazing since losing the last round in the CDBG funding. Um, as of June 2014, at the end of our fiscal year last year, from the support of the CDBG rounding last time, we had raised the amount of children up under, who are, were under court jurisdiction to 50%. We were serving 50% of the children in Del Norte County. So that was a, a huge accomplishment, and um, we are so grateful that the, we continue to get CDBG funding, and we are very hopeful that we can get um, funding this next round. Since losing the funding, the number of children we have uh, were able to serve at this time is down to only 18 percent, and uh, that's directly um, from the loss of CDBG funding due to our lack of being able to do community outreach and uh, branding in the community, uh, recruit and train and supervise. We've had to let staff go, so um, you know we're. Uh, really excited and hopeful that we'll get the next round and again we'll be working on um, serving as many children as we possibly can who are under the court jurisdiction are there any questions about the CASA program or thank you thank you very much Good work. any other public comment Good morning my name is Maggie Kraft I'm the executive director of the area one agency on aging and and I think it's great that you have included the Senior Center and, of course, CASA, because that work is really important. But our organization uh, passes federal and state funding through to the local Senior Center for the meals they provide. And we've been doing that for ever since, ever since the Senior Center existed and ever since we had that funding. But the problem is, is the federal and state dollars have not kept up with the need with inflation, with food costs, with anything. So anything the local communities can do, like you are doing right now, to include senior services, especially those funded by the Older Americans Act, which are not being funded at the levels they need, um, anything you can do is much appreciated. So I really support this. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any other public comment? Yes, good morning. I'm Tom Pulaski with Crescent City, California. And um, I just want to address for a moment um, the issue concerning s extra funding for code enforcement. And uh, I just uh, would want to caution uh, the supervisors about a one-size-fits-all approach to code enforcement. Uh, I've been a resident of Klamath in the past. I live now in Crescent City. And I've traveled through Smith River, known a lot of community members there as well. And, and um, there are different types of living, I guess is the way I would describe it, in different communities. Klamath is a Native American community. And while I, I don't want to stereotype, there are certain folks that uh, live in a rural setting. And uh, they like to have an extra car in their driveway, for instance, for parts. And that's just his country living. I've known... Uh, Farmers in Klamath, you know, there's a farmer in Klamath that, that uh, has a couple of vehicles stored for extra parts and he has his tractor there. And, uh, you know, I, I know I'm speaking kind of in anecdotes here for a moment, but, uh, uh, you know, I know Mr. Mason. I know he does an admirable job for the most part, but I also know 
that uh, there may be some areas where, again, a one-size-fits-all approach uh, doesn't work uh, necessarily. We have different people in this county from different social, different cultural heritages, and uh, I've just advised us to keep that in consideration uh, when we go out uh, with our code enforcement officer. Uh, so I just appreciate your consideration with that, and I pray that the extra funding that is being spoken of won't be just simply used to send out code enforcement to, well, in some cases, just harass people when maybe a conversation is better, maybe a uh, gaining understanding uh, is better in many respects of different ways of living. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, and just to speak to that real briefly, the process is not going to change. Is what it will do is make monies available for agreed upon projects that couldn't otherwise be funded. Any other public comment? Actually, just to clarify, the, the code enforcement funds that if they were awarded would be for staff salaries oh. and overhead. It wouldn't be for actual cleanups. Okay. Okay. That would be a different, whole different avenue more towards the housing rehab type situations so that's how we qualified that is by limiting it to certain areas where the poverty level was high enough correct okay yes. so yes. let me understand this so we're putting on more people to spend what little money we have for code enforcement no it's it's more to supplant the income of, of what we currently have okay okay any other public comment Okay, I'm going to uh, close the public comment at this time, bring it back to the board for an action. Can I get a motion on the resolution, please? I make a motion. Second. Make a motion to approve the resolution of the Delnor County Board of Supervisors, approving an application for funding from the 2015 State Community Development Law Grant and authorize community administrative officer to execute a grant agreement and any amendments thereto with the state of California. Second. For the purposes of that grant. It's been moved and seconded the included in that. Resolution are the allocations uh, to CASA, Senior Nutrition, Smith River Community Services District, El Dorado, Safe Routes to Schools, and General Administration, as well as the supplemental activity. Hold the vote, please. Supervisor McClure? Yes. Supervisor Gitlin? Yes. Supervisor Hemmingson? Yes. Supervisor Howard? Yes. Chair Finnegan? Yes. Which brings us to a 1045 timed item, which is a presentation from the Area 1 Agency on Aging. Good morning again. Welcome. Thank you for having me. I enjoy driving here even in the rain. I uh, have a slideshow I was going to show you, but I wanted to go over the notes that I provided um, to the uh, board and just to let you know in clarification of the corrected item I gave you, what I did inadvertently was put a bunch of funding into the first column and so I separated it out so you could see the different sources of funding. So the numbers are the same, they're just um, corrected. Um, so with that, um, what I'm here to do today is report back to you regarding our contract and the scope of work that we agreed to do for the county for this fiscal year. And we're still in the fiscal year, but I thought it was a good opportunity to come and see you and report on this and, and a couple other items of interest, probably of interest to the county. Uh, we have, uh, we are charged with creating an area plan for both Humboldt and Del Norte counties. And this plan is based on the requirements of the state and federal governments. We held hearings uh, in McKinleyville and also here in Crescent City just last week to receive public input on that plan. And this is the fourth year of a four-year plan, so there will not be any significant changes to the plan uh, re related to how the funding is being dispersed, but there will be a new four-year plan, brand new, that will need to be created for the following four years. So. This is a, the fourth year in a four-year plan. We also are to ensure that certain services are provided at certain minimum levels, and those include uh, access services, such as transportation, outreach, information assistance, and care management services. The focus with the limited funds in this area is on outreach information assistance, 
and I gave you information about roughly what is being provided. We don't put any money into transportation at this point because there just isn't enough money, but it is an issue. I was interested to hear what um, Supervisor McClure said about the Uber and, and uh, what's well, the other one, Lyft, because I've, all, I've thought about that too, thinking we need to get into some kind of business because there's a lot of people, especially seniors, but any anybody who doesn't have a car uh, needs help getting around in rural areas. It's a real problem that we see in these two counties. So I thought that was really interesting. We also provide limited in-home services and this has been cut um, again, due to the federal sequester that a lot of people have forgotten about, those cuts that were made a couple years ago have stayed in place for our services. So those, those, mo those monies have not been re reallocated or reimbursed back to us. Um, and so we also provide legal assistance, uh, funding $36,000 a year. That was also cut from 40000 due to the sequester. So these services have all seen reductions over the few years. Um, rather than increases as our senior population continues to increase, we're going, unfortunately, in the other direction. Um, it's kind of ironic. It, um, the Older Americans Act was signed in 1965, which was the year after the last baby boomer was born. And I don't think, I, I don't know what they were thinking in 65, because I was just a wee one. But um, I don't think anyone had any idea what that that baby boomer boom would be doing to us now almost 50 years later. So uh, it's very challenging. Um, we also contract with the Del Norte Senior Center, as I mentioned, um, for meals. And they they do a great job of, of, of doing a lot with very little, as, as we heard. And I'm hope, hoping that this goes through so that they can get back closer to normal, whatever normal will be in the moment. Um, we also had a contract with the Healy Senior Center down in Red Redway. They gave up that contract um, because they felt that for the little amount of money they got, the burden, the, the regulatory burden was too great. And I have to say that I could not argue with them. The regulatory burden put on these uh, Older Americans Act funds is, is far too great for the amount of money we receive in our two counties. Um, but their money was reallocated to the three remaining nutrition sites. Uh, we are also we also are charged with doing audits, um, monitoring of our subcontractors, Del Norte Senior Center among them, and we um, are conducting those assessments now. They should be done. They'll be done by the end of the fiscal year. We also um, are audited by the state to make sure we spend the money right. So they'll be out again to audit us, uh, and we also submit reports from the sub subcontractors and those programs we provide to the state on a regular quarterly basis and annual basis. Um, those data collection methods are not very user friendly, but that you don't, you all know government, other federal and state funding, so I don't need to go into that. Um, we also are involved in a number of different groups and advisory boards to provide input and comment to issues related to seniors. Um, so that's another thing that we do. And we are available to the county in terms of providing you data, statistics regarding seniors, um, whatever numbers you need. We have a number of reports about when uh, Supervisor McClure was talking about the Awani principle. Um, we have a number of reports about uh, age friendly communities and how different parts of the world are addressing the, the natural thing we do every day, which get, is to get older. Um, so I can, I can make those accessible to you if you'd like. They're meaty things, but they're, they're very interesting. And they're all saying the same thing, uh, that we need to be paying attention to this. And then, of course, I'm supposed to report to you. So here I am. Um, some areas of concern I wanted to just let you know that these activities that we do um, continue to be difficult to manage because of the federal and state government. Um, I would say they're changing in reporting, fiscal year manipulations, and surveys. Um, we now have a fiscal year that goes from July through September, and then we have another fiscal year that goes from October to June. Then we have one that goes from April to March. I mean. I don't know where people get the idea that a three month, three months is a fiscal year, but, but for some whatever reason due to the sequester, we are now doing so many different budgets. And every time we spend time doing that, 
it makes me think, you know, that is money that's not going to serve seniors. That is money that we're, be re we're being required to spend to do, to track the money and be accountable for the money that we're supposed to be providing services with, but now we have to provide this, uh, this and it's, it's, a, it's a mess. Um, they continue to require more and more from us. We're the fourth smallest area agency in the, uh, the state and the smallest existing nonprofit. Um, they don't, they just don't, they don't, it just makes it more and more difficult. When you get too small, it gets very difficult. So we're in the position that if we were to give up the role of the area agency for the two counties, the state would be approaching both counties and saying to you, would you like to take over these responsibilities? And the process is they would come to the two counties and say, okay, who wants to do it? And if one county said they wanted to do it and the other county agreed, then that would happen. Or there could be a joint powers authority that you and Humboldt County would do. The state won't split the money, um, nor would it be really in Donor's benefit to split the money because the amount you get would be so little you couldn't really get anything started for that amount of money. So, um, and if neither counties want to deal with this, and um, I could talk to, to anyone offline and show you the the requirements, um, then they would go and see if there are any local nonprofits that would want to serve the two county area. Um, and barring that, if that were not to occur, the state would be stuck scratching their head and trying to figure out who they would find to do this job. Um, but meanwhile, the direct services we provide are mostly running without a deficit, although I'm working on our budget for next year and it's, it's not quite there yet. Um, but that's, due be, that's because if we have to, we can cut services. Again, the irony of it. We can cut services, but we can't cut the data tracking of those services. Uh, this disturbs us, and we do a lot of fundraising to try to make up for it. Seniors do uh, have expectations to be able to access the services that they need, and without um, the Older Americans Act being reauthorized and more money being put in by the state of California, which isn't happening right now, other than what they have to put in to match the federal dollars, we're not going to have the services that we need in our communities. Um, so I want to give you some good news, um, since I haven't yet, and I apologize for that, but I'm giving it to you straight. Um, we did, in Humboldt County, we received some Humboldt-based grants to do some, uh, to put out a survey about what's called a senior village. And we collected quite a bit of data, including um, data from seniors over 300 seniors living in Del Norte County. Uh, I'm meeting with a group today that uh, is based on that data collected and, and looking at needs, is, is interested in looking at how they might be able to develop some kind of volunteer driver program locally. So I'm gonna meet with them for lunch and talk about how we might be able to support that. Um, a village isn't actually, so you know, it's not an actual place. It's a, it's a concept, it's a way to provide seniors with just the right amount of services they need to keep them living in their own homes. Um, whether it's getting, finding them access to um, qualified repair people or lawyers or accountants or whether it's about bringing a volunteer in to take them to the grocery store or a doctor's office or to climb up on a ladder to change the light bulbs that haven't been changed or mowing the lawn. So that's the kind of service it is. Um, so we developed a survey, and I'm going to, um, because I've kind of, oops, that was me. Let me do this. Okay. I'm going to run through this a little bit. Um, I've given you this information before, um, just as a kind of a, um, you, you all know this, um, but we're at about 32,000 people in the two counties, over 60. Um, talked about the air plan. That's our, you know, your geography. You probably know the square miles. It's how many people we have in the two counties, and about 20% of the population overall in the two counties. It's it's pretty comparable in both counties. It's 60 plus. So I talked about those priority services because um, I want to get to the data. I want to show you the the report. I talked about all this. This gives you what we target for the access, by the way, and this is what we're roughly spending on access. 
um, which is information assistance outreach. Um, the senior information guides that we produce every two years in home services, legal assistance. Well, that's a good one. There we go. I talked about challenges. Um, this, this gives you just a slide of where our population is going. And if this were my, my um, retirement portfolio, I would be really excited about the red line. Um, but those, that's the number of seniors that we're anticipating. And um, so one issue is obviously there's more seniors, but the other issue that I think is relevant to what um, Supervisor uh, Howard was speaking about is making sure our youth are taken care of and prepared um, to, to, to be, be adults and be, you know, be people in our community. We won't have a lot of them, but who's going to take care of these seniors? We do need our, our children trained and educated, but we need more of them, I suppose, is what this chart would imply. Um, okay, so I talked about this. That gives you a $300,000 loss. A lot of that was state money, but also federal money. We're losing an average of 3.3 to 10% every year. Here is your, your data. 70, about 17% of all the seniors in the two counties live in Del Norte County. And this gives you the, the, the allocation of the funds that we provide um, to this county from the funds we have. And these are the numbers that I pr provided you all with, or with the board with. Um, this it relates to the Older Americans Act funding and, and health insurance counseling funding. Um, this includes nutrition and legal programs. So you're, we're spending about 21% up here. And, and that's just, we have to spend more than 17% because it just costs, it, there's costs, the smaller you get, the more it costs. So, and this is the RSVP program. We spend about 23% of that funding here. Um, and thank goodness for the county, um, you provide us um, a match of 24,000 to help match the um, funds we get from the feds to do the area plan work. So here's a survey. The, these are the people that returned the survey. I guess it says 232. Um, I thought it was a little more than that. But, and this is their age spread um, of, of where the seniors, it's, it's pretty similar, but most of the seniors uh, responding are 60, 69, 70, 79. This is what people said in terms of what has the greatest impact on their ability to remain in their current housing. And I, I'm bringing you the housing information because I know affordable housing is an issue. Um, and for, for seniors in Del Norte, in Humboldt, the number one issue was driving might be too difficult. In other words, seniors were saying their biggest worry about staying independent is whether they can drive. Here, and it makes sense with everything with Sutter Coast, but here, biggest worry, although it's very close to driving still, but was that medical services would not be available um, that might cause people to have to move. And then driving being too difficult, um, not enough money, and, and then having other services and some of the physical challenges, how CR too big. So these are the things that, that, that seniors worry about. Um, this is a housing situation of the people who filled out the survey. Um, in Del Norte, you have a lot more renters, and you have a lot, uh, compared to Humboldt, more homeowners who still have mortgages. Both of those things um, are significant because they don't have as much control over their income. Um, your homeowners without a mortgage are less likely to move even if they're in a home that doesn't suit them anymore because they feel like if I move I have to sell it, I have to pack this stuff up, issues there. So, um, In Del Norte you see people living alone um, a little higher than the Humboldt numbers and living with partner spouse a little lower but you see a larger group living with extended family and a very small number of people who have roommates, um, which I guess is a little more common, living with non-related people. So I have a list of what, what people are looking for, things about age-friendly communities. The um, thing I want to say about seniors in terms of the survey is seniors are a diverse group of people, just like the rest of us, and they don't all want one thing. 
Um, 50% of the people responded to our survey have an annual household income of under $35,000. I mentioned that what they're most worried about. Um, they also want a choice where to live that includes access to walking, transportation, and services. They want energy efficient housing in multi-generational neighborhoods close to things they need. They don't want to be segregated into a senior, senior housing. There's, some might, but the majority don't. We want to live where we want to live. Um, and that doesn't change as you age. They want help with basic home chores and home modifications so they can live safely and not to have to move unless they want to. And they need help finding trusted providers of services. Uh, and no one wanted to move into assisted living facilities. Um, we're, we're also looking at other services that we might be able to provide um, to the communities that get us away from federal and state regulations and funding. So these are some of the things they say they want. And the World Health Organization lists a bunch of things that they have found that are, make things age friendly. Um, and age friendly means for all ages. It's universal design, it's to help kids, help people with disabilities, help everybody. Um, so those are, and I have a lot more information about that if you're interested, but I, I know Supervisor McClure brought a whole bunch of stuff back from her conference, so you're in good shape. And here are all my sites because I don't want you to think I made any of that stuff up. Um, actually, I should give credit to my planner, Marin Rose, who, who put this slideshow together, and she didn't make any of it up either. So I don't know if there's any questions on anything that I, I know my time has gone rapidly um, you, away. Ma I sure appreciate it. Any questions from board members, comments, Supervisor Gitlin? Hey, Maggie, I just want to say what a, a great job in keeping this community informed. Um, addressing the needs of seniors, which according to the silver tsunami, we're looking at the doubling of that population with this in the next four to seven years, the senior population of 60, 60 plus. Uh, currently, Delaware County, you've mentioned in your report, 6,400 plus. Can we expect double digit seniors population in well, this we, county? We do, but not, not in four to seven years. That would panic even me. Um, but it, but but yes, I think it's going up. Um, there's sort of some, I have some other data here. I don't memorize that because it's too funny. Well, I was funny, looking at the graph and it, I, I extrapolated yeah, that on that yeah, graph that showed the steady rise. And yeah, and it's just, it's, it's, it's because you have so many more baby boomers. Um, now, the other things that impact this is if people can't stay here because of whatever the issues are, um, then you may have a downward trend because people move away. But for those families who are born and raised here, their families here, most people aren't going to move away. Um, but you're not, maybe the good news is, is you, you're not going to attract as many new seniors here. Um, because that's, they don't figure in on that. They figure that, okay, those seniors who live there now at that age, aging. But, um, you know, there may be people who move away. There may be people who move here. It might even out, but it is growing. Um, we're all, I'm aging. I've just got about 15, 20 minutes older just by talking to you. Yep, 2025, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> see, I can't even keep track of time anymore. What's wrong? Thank you, Maggie, very right. much. Any other comments? Yes, I just want to thank you for your good work that you do and the assistance that we have at the Senior Center mm -hmm. um, because it's been pretty frightening times and we've made yes. it through, which is pretty exciting. Thanks. Primarily, I think that we just have a very versatile cook that is willing to fantastic, yes, to to make things stretch, and so I appreciate that, and I appreciate the work. Um, I just got my national park pass that I can get into every national park for free for the rest of my life because I'm at 62. So I agree that we need the services. I um, am concerned about the um, housing element in our county for seniors to make sure that the the stock is adequate mm -hmm. and I agree that it needs to be probably spread out rather than the traditional let's put granny over here mm -hmm. and because now granny wants to live with the millennials downtown mm -hmm. and kind of move around. So I'm hoping that we as a community will take that look at our housing for seniors. Thank you. Thank and, you. I, and I do want to say that baby boomers are not going to, are going to be different. Um, they're going to, they, they were different when they were baby boomers and they're going to be different than their parents. We're all different than our parents. So they're going to, there'll be different expectations and for everything. Supervisor Howard. 
Yeah, just to, to add on to the great points raised by the fellow supervisors and the excellent presentation, this has been a great interest to me on uh, seniors. I had uh, family members participate in programs down in Tiburon and the Marin County area, specifically with the concept of villages. And, and I think that point is extremely important because it speaks to the independence piece mm -hmm. that you so cleverly articulated in your presentation today. It's important because as we begin to learn more about longevity and what makes longevity important for seniors, not here just in the United States, but around the world, and what makes that tick. And the science is there, and more importantly, the social science is there. And we've learned through various studies like in the Blue Zone and presentations by David Butner uh, through National Geographic and presentations at CSAC that uh, seniors don't necessarily need to age rapidly. And there's things that we could do in our community to make sure those efforts keep ticking, whether it's around nutrition, whether it's around ensuring that they have social groups that exchange ideas, whether it's around making sure they have that one glass of wine a day, making sure they have religion. Those concepts of building blocks. But some of the most important things to seniors out there is that sense of purpose. And I think if we continue to communicate that, whether it's through the, this program or other programs, bringing those concepts together I think is one of the most important things is mm -hmm. making sure our seniors are living a long, healthy, and happy life in our community. Because we're getting there too. I mean, I think we want the world to be the way, way we want it to be. And when you're a senior, you don't change. You, it, it, a lot, it's not a light switch. It's a, it's a lifelong process. And so they, we, are all, we are all us. Thank you. I am one of that 17% too. Mm -hmm. um, and no, I didn't. I'm still in <laughs> denial. Uh, Thank you. <laughs> I don't even take the discount at Denny's. Um, but anyway, since the days of Patty Berg and identifying the needs of seniors and trying to meet them, I appreciate the continuance of the job. Thank you very much. With that, we're going to go to another public hearing which we had scheduled for 11 o'clock. It's going to be uh, regarding a decision of the Planning Commission that's being appealed um, for a matter of process. While I wait in at the Planning Commission level, I will not be weighing in here at the board level, and, and if you want to see what I had to say, it's in the minutes. Uh, as an affected property owner, I am going to have to recuse myself from um, participating in the discussion here, so I am going to be abstaining. And, uh, Chair, I also have to uh, uh, recuse myself uh, for conflict of interest. So the Chair and the Vice Chair are going to be absent from this discussion, so the senior member no pun intended there. Supervisor McClure is going to run it. Hey, I resemble that remark. <laughs> I kind of like it personally. As you're talking about putting <laughs> granny over there. But yeah, this granny's <laughs> not going over there. That's the thing. Um. Thank you. So we're opening a public hearing. Do we need to have the applicant and the appellant uh, have a times? Or would you prefer to, how would you prefer to present? Would you prefer to present prior to the county as the applicant? My name is Rick Ether, and I asked last week to have this extended to the next board meeting due to the complexity of the issues. Okay, so you're formally requesting an extension? Right. And how long would you like that extension? To the next meeting would be fine. Okay, so that next meeting date is April 14th at, would it be, would it work again at 11? That should be fine. Okay, so we will reschedule for April 14th at 11 a.m. at the request of the applicant. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So we have a continuance. For the audience, when there's a request for a continuance from the applicant, there can be a variety of reasons they're requesting. And so what will happen is that we will reopen the hearing on the 21st and we won't have any testimony today. Yeah. A point of order before everybody leaves. I have a question of counsel that if you, the applicant requested a continuance as the first person up, can I continue to keep it open for testimony? Yes. 
Typically, you could um, if, if the board determines that that would be to the advantage of the public, um, though it would allow him a little bit more um, preparation time because he will know what the issues are prior to his coming back with his agent. So, yes, you could. So I guess I could ask the public if you would prefer to give testimony today, which would exclude testimony on the 21st. Or would you rather wait to hear the case and then provide testimony? Then you're welcome to provide testimony. Sorry about that, guys. It's okay. Richard Hansen, 805 Dundas Road, uh, parallel the uh, properties that are uh, that this issue is about uh, caging cats and and uh, having a mass amount of them. I per currently am a two resident uh, person. I live in Pocatello, Idaho and here part time also. And uh, my neighbor in Pocatello, Idaho raises cats, quite a few in her house. She's a cat lady. And uh, the I have uh, an acre plus next to her property and uh, I have a uh, high influx of stray cats coming into the area because of the, her feeding them outside and also um, attracting other animals, other cats in because of the amount of uh, animals that she does have. And so that, for that reason, I'm opposed to, you know, lifting your decision on the matter and hope that you'll weigh in on that feeling also. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else for the record that may not be able to be here on the 21st? Then we will continue to the 21st, okay. 2014. I, I, have a, I have a question to ask. I know some people left here. Um, I don't know what their availability is for the next meeting date, April 14th. Um, most of them are my neighbors and will be available. Well, they'll be available. And I'm gonna presume they'll have an opportunity to deliver you won't be here, but is there anyone who's left who also won't be here? I want to make sure we hear everybody. As far as I know, they will all be here. All right. I appreciate your letting those people who are out the door let them know they'll have an opportunity You're to good. give testimony. Okay. That'd be that'd be for right now. That'd be correct. Thank you. And Supervisor Gitlin, if I could, I know uh, Miss Constable did run out just to see if there was anybody that needed to be rounded up that could come back that may not be here for the next meeting. So we may just want to give them just a couple seconds. Certainly. And I just would like to just make sure that uh, while you brought that up, Randy, that uh, everyone has an opportunity to weigh in um, because of uh, continuance. We want to hear all the testimony, and that's all the testimony. So I know there are some people who are left here, and I just want to make certain that when we, when we have this meeting next month, that those people will have that opportunity to render testimony on this. No one will be excluded. So that would be the point of uh, today's meeting. Just that would be someone. correct. Everybody would be allowed to present testimony at the next meeting. If they're unavailable at the next meeting, they can present it today. We just got the high sign that everybody's good. They also can present any, any comments in writing if they wish as well between now and then. You officially continued? Yes. Okay. Thank you. With that, I'm going to go back to the consent agenda. Can I get a motion on the consent agenda, please? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to pull for discussion items 7 and 8 from the consent agenda. Okay, do you want to discuss them or do you want to pull them? I want to pull it for discussion, pull from the consent agenda and I'd like okay, to discuss can, them. Can I get a motion on the consent agenda minus number seven? So moved. Number eight. Can I get a second? Second. So moved and second to approve the consent agenda minus items number seven and number eight. Public comment, please. Back to the board. Comments, questions? Pull the vote, please. Supervisor McClure? Yes. Supervisor Howard? Yes. Supervisor Hemmingson? Yes. Supervisor Gitlin? Yes. Chair Finnegan? Yes. Now, in that consent agenda, there were a couple of resolutions, and uh, one was uh, proclaiming 
the week uh, <coughs> March 19th through 28th is Tsunami Preparedness Week. And Supervisor Howard, do you have that? I do. Would you please read that? Certainly. This is a proclamation of the Del Norte County Board of Supervisors proclaiming March 19th through the 28th as Tsunami Preparedness Week. Whereas the California's long coastline in proximity to other coast, coastal states with offshore earthquake faults and its location on the Pacific Ring of Fire make it vulnerable to tsunamis. And whereas California has been struck by more than two dozen tsunamis with, with waves three feet or more in the height since 1812 including 15 that have caused damage, including the devastation to the Crescent City Harbor on March 11, 2011. And whereas a dozen residents of Crescent City, California were killed by the tsunami generated by the 1964 Alaska earthquake. Whereas tsunamis are caused by underwater earthquakes and landslides that occur at any time and with little warning. And whereas education and awareness are fundamental in saving lives in a tsunami event. And whereas the state of California, the National Weather Service, the County of Del Norte, and the City of Crescent City will commemorate the anniversary of the 1964 tsunami by testing their ability to issue a tsunami warning for the Del Norte County via emergency alert system on Wednesday, March 25th, 2015, between 11 and 12 noon. Whereas the Governor's Office of Emergency Services hopes to expand participation of all coastal cities in the test in 2015 and beyond. Now therefore, be it proclaimed by the Board of Supervisors of Del Norte County that the week of March 23rd through 29th, 2015 as Tsunami Preparedness Week in Del Norte County on this 24th day of March 2015. Signed by Chair Finnegan, Del Norte County Board of Supervisors. Thank you. Cindy? I want to remind everybody, it's just a drill tomorrow. <laughs> just a drill. It's a good, just great a time. It's just a test. Drop practice, practice, drop cover and hold. <laughs> Thanks, Cindy, for all the work you do. Appreciate it. And there was also a um, proclamation, number three, was uh, County Day of Recognition, recognition for National Service. Uh, and Supervisor Hemmingson. I, I do that. have that. Uh, this is a proclamation, uh, County Day of Recognition for National Service, April 7, 2015. Whereas service to <clears throat> others is a hallmark of the American character and central to how we meet our challenges. And whereas the nation's counties are increasingly turning to national service and volunteers as a cost-effective strategy to meet county needs. And whereas AmeriCorps and Senior Corps participants address the most pressing challenges facing our communities, from educating students for the jobs of the 21st century and supporting veterans and military families to providing health services and helping communities recover from natural disasters. And whereas national service expands economic opportunity by creating more sustainable, resilient communities and providing education, career skills, and leadership abilities for those who serve. And whereas AmeriCorps and Senior Corps participants serve in more than 60,000 locations across the, <clears throat> excuse me, across the country, bolstering the civic, neighborhood, and faith-based organiz organizations that are so vital to our economic and social well-being, and whereas national service participants increase the impact of organizations they serve, both through their direct service and by managing millions of additional volunteers, and whereas national service represents a unique public-private partnership that invests in community solution and leverages non-federal resources to strengthen community impacts and increase the return on taxpayer dollars. And whereas national service participants demonstrate commitment, dedication, and patriotism by making an intensive commitment to service, a commitment that remains with them in their future endeavors. And whereas the Corporation for National and Community Service shares a priority with county executives nationwide to engage citizens, improve lives, and strengthen communities, and is joining with National Association of Counties and County Executives across the country for the County Day of Recognition for National Service on April 7, 2015. Therefore, be it resolved that the Board of Supervisors of Del Norte County do hereby proclaim April 7, 2015 as National Service Recognition Day and encourage residents to recognize the positive impact of national service in our county, to thank those who serve, 
and to find ways to give back to their communities on this 24th day of March, 2015. Maggie, you gonna... I was supposed to be joined by somebody who um, is uh, also runs some of these programs, and I want you to know the people that wrote that sent me this. They want me to read this. That's not going to happen. Thank you. Um, thank you. Uh, we it. we have uh, over 80 volunteers in retired senior volunteer program in this county, and we're always recruiting more. Uh, we're recruiting volunteers who work at Barrow Boy Ranch and uh, appreciate the time spent by the staff here helping getting my head straightened out on that one. Um, and we're always trying to recruit to help seniors, help people in the community, help children. So um, it is exciting to see what the retired folks in your community are, are. They're not sitting back, they're getting up and helping out and we really appreciate it. Thank you for this. Thank you. Thank you. This time I'm going to uh, bring up the emergency item that was an invitation by Congressman Huffman asking that our group choose one representative to, committed to attending the 10 local meetings prepared to provide input from the organization regarding the last chance grades it's a stakeholder group. Um, previously I had been invited to sit with the congressman um, and um, but there was this email that went out to all the agencies that are going to be involved that asked that we do it. So respecting the protocol I think that this board should take an action and I would ask to receive a motion appointing myself as the, not just the chair, but as the supervisor of that district to this stakeholder group on behalf of the Board of Supervisors. So moved. Second. Moved and seconded. Public comment. Back to the board for the discussion. I just have one, one question that on, um, like I'm sure local transportation will have a representative. Are we going to have more than one supervisor being able to be at the table because of the different hats? I'm not sure that the Local Transportation Commission received the invitation. I do sit on both. Um, it, I, I'm just thinking that there's a way that up. we could yeah. have more people, but if that's... Well, there has been, this is the first attempt to try to expand that group. Okay. Um, because it used to be just the property owners, which was state park, national park, right. tribal, and timber. This is much more. Um, there at our last local transportation commission meeting, this was not an item of, for action. So hopefully it will be at the next one. Okay, thank okay. you. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? No. Nope. Please record that Supervisor Gitlin does not favor the supervisor of that district sitting on this stakeholder group. Uh, with that, we're gonna go to budget transfers. Can I get a motion on? Uh, I would move that we approve budget transfer 03-04, 03-05, 03-06, and 03-07, which is 11, 12, 13, and 14 in your agenda. It's been moved and seconded. Public comment. Back to the board. Questions, comments? Pull the vote, please. Supervisor McClure? Yes. Supervisor Gitlin? Yes. Supervisor Hemmingson? Yes. Supervisor Howard? Yes. Chair Finnegan? Yes. Um, with that, we're going to get a review the um, annual update and accept public comment regarding um, office, Governor's Office of Planning and Research, regarding the Department of Housing and Community Development, HCD. Randy, item 19 on the agenda. Good morning. <clears throat> So this is the uh, annual report that we are required under state law to submit to the state. Um, we report out to the Office of Planning of uh, OPR Office of Planning and Research and HCD essentially reporting out on the status of our uh, implementation of our general plan, which includes the housing element. So a great time for the discussion uh, this morning on the senior housing issues. That was very timely. <clears throat> um, as you can see in the report, overall the progress that we continue to make on the uh, general plan is, is good. Um, of course, we'd like to make more progress but because of budgetary reasons and staffing um, shortages. Uh, we basically try and do as much as we, as we can. Um, out of the 48 programs, what you would see, um, including the 23 housing element programs, 26 have been completed, are in progress, or are ongoing programs implemented on a continuous basis. Uh, two of the programs are still incomplete, 20 have not yet been initiated. 
Um, over the past year, I just wanted to highlight, <clears throat> excuse me, that we did um, adopt um, a new housing element, which is a huge step, um, and we do um, address some of those senior housing issues that we discussed uh, this morning. In addition to all the other um, special needs housing, low income, extremely low income, um, homeless, um, all those issues um, as required by state law are included within that housing element in our program implementation status report includes um, a summarization of that. Um, that was a huge accomplishment. Um, another program that um, we're hoping to make progress on that was initiated last year is the adoption of an airport land use compatibility plan. And it looks like at tomorrow's California Transportation Commission meeting, as part of the statewide CIP, we should be getting about $135,000 to do that. So if we can get <clears throat> that secured, which again looks like the case tomorrow, uh, that would be major progress on one of the steps that we've had um, historically had issues with impl implementing, which is that airport land use compatibility plan. If you have any questions about the summarization of your report, definitely available for you. Um, hopefully uh, you agree that we're making good progress on that and uh, direct staff to send that out. Great work. The annual reports can be a real pain sometimes and very tedious, but excellent job. Any public, uh, any public comment on it? Back to the board. Comments? No, good work. Thanks, Randy. Thanks. Okay. Um, so I, uh, we can just accept this by consensus or do we need a vote on this? I think you're just supposed to direct staff. It looks like you can accept it um, and direct staff. Okay, so we're just going to accept it by consensus of the board and direct staff file. Thanks very much. Um, number 21 is to approve and authorize the engineering traffic study survey. Um, the results are in your packet. Uh, we've talked about this several times before. Be careful what you ask for. Mm -hmm. uh, traffic studies can often increase, as it did in one particular case. On, uh, Inyo, between yeah. Small and Washington, I believe. Um, who wants to present? I know the Highway Patrol is here, but we'll have the engineer. Okay. I would move that we approve and authorize the engineering traffic study results on those roads that are listed. I'd yes. Okay. It's been moved second and second to approve motion. the uh, traffic survey results, make the changes as required. Uh, public comment. Back to the board. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Carries unanimously. Thank you for all the hard work. <coughs> Appreciate it. People don't understand the process on a lot of this stuff uh, in the 85 percentile. The uh, item number 22 was uh, Supervisor uh, Hemmingson, Vice Chair, uh, asked that we replace, we've talked about this before, replacing the public members of the Local Transportation Commission upon the appointment of a third supervisor. Supervisor yes. Hemmingson? Uh, yeah, um, our previous uh, uh, county council had an objection to having three board members uh, on the uh, local transportation commission. Um, we've had uh, our current county council uh, research this, and uh, she, has, uh, uh, she has no objection to us uh, having three uh, board members uh, on the local transportation commission. Uh, and like the other uh, counties, uh, all of the other counties within the state of California that have three uh, uh, board members uh, on their local transportation commission, I would like to see us uh, go back to that uh, same appointment of having three supervisors appointed to the local transportation commission with the other two members being alternates. Is that a motion? It is. Okay. Is there a second? second. It's been moved and seconded. Discussion. Council, you want to weigh in? Yes, I would. Um, I have researched into the issue to see if there's anything in the Brown Act that specifically precludes the Board of Supervisors from having three members sitting on a statutorily cre created commission such as the El Tico Commission. Um, there seems to, there is actually a, a, an exception that has been carved out through case law that allows three board members to sit on a statutorily created commission um, that is dealing with um, business of that commission. Um, the general provision of the uh, prohibition of the Brown Act is if board members are sitting on a commission that's dealing with business that will be coming before the board. The El Tico doesn't usually come before the board, seldom comes before the board if ever. So there does not seem to be any sort of prohibition to having three members. It does seem to be standard practice throughout the state to have that, um, as well as the city also has three members sitting on the Correct. board. Public comment? Excuse me. Back to the board. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Carries unanimously. I will have a recommendation for that appointment on our next consent agenda. Um, before we get too far away from the 
last chance grade stakeholder group, I would just like to make the announcement, if you don't already know, that on Monday, March 30th, uh, down in the Klamath Community Services District in the town site on Salmon Avenue, that is different from the Yurok Tribal Office, so in the Community Services District, from 4 to 4.45, uh, Congressman Huffman will be there to make the announcement regarding the formation of this. He has also previously asked me to sit with him um, when this announcement is made. So hope to see you all there. Item number 24 is to authorize the chair to send a letter of support for Assembly Bill 203, which increases the payment due date from the fire prevention fee from 30 days to 60 days. All those in the state responsibility area get your $117 bill. We always look forward to that every year. Sure this would know. ask for not asking you not to appeal it, as you should. It um, unfortunately probably will not get overturned, and if it ever did, then uh, the legislature would just find another funding mechanism. Uh, but this would allow you 60 days rather than 30 days, correct? That is correct, and it, it deals more with the nature of getting those notices to rural areas. Right. So can I get a motion uh, regarding? Motion to approve. Second. Moved and second to send the letter of public comment. Back to the board. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Carries unanimously. Any other uh, miscellaneous legislative and budget matters that we need to know about? Uh, uh, just Serena? as you mentioned, there's a, a tsunami of bills coming out, and we'll be reviewing whatever is effective or affects Delmar County. Uh, budget wise, we'll be coming out with some budget directives for the requested budget process for that starts in April and likely be trying to maintain the uh, net cost of the general fund in the upcoming year and taking a look at what uh, resources, uh, financial resources might be available. Good. Uh, yeah, stay tuned on that. Okay, so item number seven and number eight were pulled by Supervisor Gitlin to uh, initiate the conversation. Can I get a motion on both items seven and eight to approve and authorize the chair to sign these agreements uh, if they are approved. So moved. Second. Moved and seconded. Supervisor <coughs> Gitlin, you want to start the discussion? Yes. Uh, <coughs> Crystal, are you here? Uh, could you? Uh, there was some confusion on seven and particularly on eight. And I'll, I'd like to start with eight first because it seems to be a, an age continuum. This is a, about a, um, a lot of money, which I think it should be discussed in front of the public. Seven is $175,908, eight is uh, $187,000. But what disturbed me about eight is the language, and I, I, I frankly didn't quite understand it. It's, uh, I'll read it to you on page 92. Transitional housing unit plus is, was created by the legislature to provide affordable housing and comprehensive supportive services for foster youth up to 24 months. So I took that at face value in 24 months, yet I also saw that from ages 21 to 24, which is number eight, uh, that's the age group it would be covered. That's 21 to 22, 22 to 23, 23 to 24. That's a total of 36 months, theoretically, is that? Mm -hmm. Am I reading that correctly? Yes. So someone could be on that program. Now, I just asked myself, did you mean up to 24 years of age instead of 24 months? That was what first occurred to me. And then I said, well, let's get an explanation on, on eight, exactly what this language, exactly what the program would cover. Um, and seven, I think, precedes it because it's ages 18 to 21. Correct. So I thought you perhaps explain that to okay. the board. So I didn't see what was submitted um, in the board letter, but um, maybe it would just be helpful if I explain both programs and how they work together. So eligibility criteria for both programs is based on emancipating from foster care at the age of 18. And that is for dependents and wards, and then also a status called transitional status, which is for wards who are in foster care placement but have completed terms and conditions of probation and generally speaking, they're transferred to the Department of Social Services for the remainder of whatever time they have left in foster care before they emancipated 18. Um, so the first program is Transitional Housing Plus Foster Care. And this is um, as a result of AB 12, which was passed, I think it was three years ago now, which are enhanced services for youth emancipating from foster care. Um, the program is, uses Title IV-E money um, so it's federal money that compensates the counties to provide these services. Um, 
So the youth can opt out of foster care or out of the dependency status. So that's actually a court proceeding, whereas in the past it was that youth automatically emancipated from foster care. So now they have to provide their rationale for why they want to leave. Um, the requirements um, for the program are that uh, the youth has to be working on reducing barriers to success, um, which you know in some cases might be a mental illness, substance use. Um, you know, there's a variety of different things that meet that criteria. Um, or they have to become employed, actively looking for employment, or um, in an education program, including a vocational, um, or a vocational training. Um, so that is available to youth from 18 to 21. They can opt out at any point in time, and they can opt back in uh, during that time frame. Then the next um, one is actually a realigned program, which preceded the other in terms of when it, it was first implemented, and that's Transitional Housing Plus um, without the foster care component. So these are youth um, and young adults, really, who have emancipated from foster care and have 24 cumulative months of housing and support services that are provided through Environmental uh, Alternatives, our contract provider. Um, so they can actually stay in THP plus foster care until the age of 21, and then they can get 24 more months on top of that through uh, THP plus. So yes, you can theoretically have five years of services. But that's a total of six years total, 18 to 21, 21 to 24, that's a total. So that's what would confuse me, is there seems to be a, a window or a, a lapse in service for that last year. Um, I was confused by that. It, it doesn't necessarily mean that you get to draw for every year that you're eligible. No. It means you're restricted to a certain amount of months within that time frame. Right. Is that the case? Uh, it, it is the case. So, for example, you emancipate at 18. Mm -hmm. So you would then have your birthday on the 19, 20, and 21. So there are three years. And that's indicated in language 36 months under 7. That's a total of 36 months. It's actually spelled out there. Yes. So when we go to 8, it's only a 24-month period. Correct. And that's still a three-year period. So that's what I want, wanted your explanation. Uh, I'm sorry. And let the public understand how the money is being spent. Well, it's actually another two years. So that's five years total. So if they elected to stay into Foster Care Plus, um, that would be the three years, and that would end at their 21. And then, at the end of their 21st year, then they would be eligible for those additional two years. Does that answer your question? So from age 23 to 24, there's, they're not in the program anymore? Oh, no, I'm sorry. No, they can go in directly. Okay. You know, it's just, it's up to them how they want to use those services. So for instance, um, they can come back in at any point in time and use THP Plus, which is the non-foster care version. And in some cases, um, youth decide they do not want to remain as dependents, and they can use that THP Plus immediately upon emancipation. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Go ahead. Sorry, I wasn't able to get a hold of Barbara Pearson on this one, but I did have a question on participation rate. Mm -hmm. What is it for Del Mar County on these programs? So we have a fairly high participation rate. I don't know exactly percentages, but we have a really low number of youth who, are, who meet the criteria for eligibility. Um, right now, I think we have four or five youth who are participating in the foster care version and currently nobody in just the THP plus. Um, so what's happened is there's been um, a change in terms of what they're seeing now that it's, it benefits them to use the THP plus foster care because they're saving that THP plus for later. And so at any period of time, it just kind of depends on who we have who's eligible. And now that they're using THP plus foster care first, that's left THP plus. Um, we, have, we have nobody in those slots right now. What's our current foster population in Dillard County? Current foster population hovers around 100 right now, and that includes a variety. It's high. Um, it includes a variety of different programs. So we have some people in reunification, some in permanency, some in guardianship. So it's a, it, it crosses a broad spectrum. And I'd be happy to talk at any point in time more about that. I appreciate it. Um, should be pointed out these are realignment dollars. Uh, uh, realignment is being used for THP plus. Correct. Right. And uh, good use of the point. It's nice to see that the program got extended by the legislature a few mm -hmm. years back. 
right. to allow people up to 24 to age out rather than just saying you're 21, you're in foster care, you're done. Mm -hmm. and, you know, it uh, is. It's a really, um, it's a really vulnerable and high risk population, and it's provided some really great services to them. And so, thank you. and we have nobody, we have nobody enrolled. Not right now in THP so, Plus. So, what are we doing for outreach? Just well, we let do, people know that this is available. Um, so, number one, they have to have emancipated from foster care. And so we are in contact with those people. But as I mentioned before, because we have such small numbers, they are um, now electing to use the foster care part first. And so the other thing that we did is we have limited THP Plus to Del Norte County residents. So you have to have emancipated from Del Norte County because it is realignment dollars. And it used to be that it was a statewide program and some counties aren't doing THP Plus any longer. They're just doing the THP Plus foster care. So. Cool. Appreciate Thank it. you. Pull the vote, please. Oh, sorry. I just have a question because I know that for years my frustration has been that it was for foster kids and our probation kids were kind of falling off the cliff. Mm -hmm. But when I read this, it refers to probation, foster care, interchangeable. Mm -hmm. So it appears to me now that probation kids who are emancipating out of probation are also eligible to participate, that it's not just for foster care. Actually, it re it, what it is referring to are probation kids who have been in foster care. At some time in their life. They have to be emancipated out at 18. And so there's a couple of things. Um, one is that when, when kids um, have completed the terms and condition of probation, um, they aren't necessarily kept in foster care. There's a really low number that are ever placed in foster care, and so that's really limited the number of youth probation youth who are eligible to the program. So it's one of the um, strict criteria is you have to have been in foster care on the 18th birthday. And, and I just want to publicly say, and it's not the messenger's fault by any means, mm -hmm. but this is a real glitch in this program. It is. Because mm -hmm. we have so many children that are 18 that are probation kids that, you know, I've been around the system long enough to know that a lot of times our foster kids, when they're still back at the seven, eight, and nine-year-old manageable, agreeable time in their life, and then when they hit the 15, 16, 17-year-old that aren't as agreeable to living in foster care, they end up back into their homes. They're back on probation, and at 18, all doors are closed. Mm -hmm. So I would really like to, you know, possibly work with the department and possibly work with uh, our state senator because that needs to be corrected. I agree. That's the reason our numbers are so low. I mean, we've no. got lots of kids on probation that are hitting the wall and are couch surfing and are living, you know, in cars and behind Safeway. I agree. Okay. It, you know, I do manage also Coastal Connections. We see a lot of yeah, those you know through there. And, yeah, I do. And um, we can't reach to these dollars to support them. And that's I also, frustrating. I think there's another thing that uh, comes into play here, and just it's worth mentioning now, which is that we have such a lack of foster care homes in Del Norte County, and almost, I think we have one remaining who will um, place Take you. teens, yeah. Yeah. And so I think that it prohibits probation from keeping youth in in placement to that 18th birthday because we don't have any place uh -huh. local to place kids. And uh -huh. so I just think it's critical that the community look at recruiting and retaining foster care providers. Thank you. It's a message we've heard before, but it needs to keep right. being repeated. So right. thank you for that. Mm -hmm. Hold the vote, please. Supervisor McClure? Yes. Supervisor Gitlin? Yes. Supervisor Howard? Yes. Supervisor Hemmingson? Yes. Chair Finnegan? Yes. And with that, Supervisor Hemmingson. If I could, I'd like to make a request, uh, Chair, to have something, uh, a, maybe a presentation put on the agenda. Um, Mr. Palmer, our uh, district ranger. Um, at the last few meetings that I've been to um, with on forest uh, service operations, they say that they don't see a lot of forest service personnel in the forest anymore. So, and I don't want to beat anybody up over this, and I'm certainly not trying to to uh, uh, put this all on Dave, but maybe we could get some information from him about the number of employees that they have, what they're doing, um, how they're managing the forest, uh, uh, those types of things. But maybe if we could get an idea of what the level of 
uh, employment for the Forest Service on our forest in Delmar County was, say, in 1990 or 1980 and what it is now. Um, Good. So we had a comparison and, 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 and find out why we're not seeing, why people aren't seeing uh, the presence of Forest Service personnel, uh, especially on the weekends. Um, and, and there seems to only be one enforcement person out there, but why aren't we seeing other uh, right. uh, Forest Service personnel out well, on Let's the invite them to get the answer to those questions. So I'm going to direct the CAO to make sure that it's on the next agenda to ask that you work with uh, Jay to get those questions in advance uh, so we don't blindside anybody. Supervisor Howard. One final item. Thank you for the recognition, Chair Fennigan. <clears throat> I just want us to be on alert as a board, uh, specifically in light of Easter next week. Um, Epic Greg King has brought forward the Easter lily problem again. And on Thursday next week, April 2nd, 6.30, he's going to be making a presentation on the Humboldt University campus. And <clears throat> we've got four remaining lily ball producers in Delaware County. We used to have 25. It's one of our last bastions of agriculture here. And more importantly, we need to be cognizant of the information that's being communicated to the public and correct, if necessary, that communication that's going out if it's not factual. And so uh, I will be attending that meeting and I'll report back to the board. Very good. Thank you. And maybe we can have something on a future agenda uh, regarding the Lily Bowl. With that, I want to thank everybody that participated. I know we had a full agenda. Appreciate it very, very much. And we will see you at our next meeting. Thank you. Um, our next meeting is April what? 14th. So instead, I would wish everybody a very happy Easter. <laughs>